Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Naomi Hausman. I'm the Director of Institutional Advancement at Grads College. A very warm welcome to all of you who are here with us via Zoom um, and to all those who are joining us uh, here in person as well. Um, I'd like to offer a special welcome to tonight's presenters who are joining us from afar uh, and also uh, as far as Israel, uh, Professor Erwin Kotler, uh, our student grads, uh, grad student Madeline Bikerti, who is joining us tonight from Slovakia, and our grads alumna Rana Honigman, who's joining us from California. So thanks to all of you uh, for being part of this evening uh, of honor and re remembrance in commemoration of Yom HaShoah. It is truly an honor to be with you today when we remember the victims of the Holocaust and honor the survivors as well as, um, as, well as the rescuers and liberators. This is a day when we remember that we must never cease our work to promote human dignity and confront hate whenever and wherever it occurs. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Ruth Sandberg, Leonard and Ethel Landau, Professor of Rabbinics and former director of the Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights here at Graz. Dr. Sandberg will offer a prayer of commemoration of Yom HaShoah. Welcome, Dr. Sandberg. I would like to offer a prayer for Yom HaShoah written by the late renowned Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Today on Yom HaShoah, we remember the victims of the greatest crime of man against man. We remember what happens when hate takes hold of the human heart and turns it to stone. What happens when victims cry for help and there is no one listening? What happens when humanity fails to recognize that those who are not in our image are nonetheless in God's image? We remember and pay tribute to the survivors who bore witness to what happened and to the victims so that robbed of their lives, they would not be robbed also of their deaths. We remember and give thanks for the righteous of the nations who saved lives, often at risk of their own, teaching us how in the darkest night, we can light a candle of hope. Today on Yom HaShoah, we call on God to help us hear your voice that says in every generation, do not murder. Do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. Do not oppress the stranger. And let us say, Amen. It's now my pleasure to introduce Madeline Vod Curdy, who is a PhD student in our Holocaust and Genocide Studies program and is one of the recipients of the Samuel P. Mandel Fellowship in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Madeline is a US citizen, but has roots in Slovakia and has been doing Holocaust research in Bratislava for quite a while. Madeline worked for several years at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. And it was there that her ability to speak Slovak led her to take a look at what kind of evidence existed about the Holocaust in Slovakia. Her research led her to the Slovak National Archives, where she discovered unexplored letters written by Slovak Jews between 1839 and 1944 to the president of the Slovak state, the notorious Roman Catholic priest, Father Joseph Tiso asking for exemptions from the Jewish code and other anti-Semitic regulations. Most of those people did not receive exemptions and perished in the Holocaust. This research was published as a book in Slovak in 2020, titled, Your Honor, Mr. President, Letters to Joseph Tiso. Madeline, thank you for representing the students in our Holocaust and Genocide program tonight. Good evening and thank you. 
When Dr. Sandberg asked me to introduce the Honorable Dr. Erwin Cutler for the inauguration of the Founding Stakeholders Endowment, I felt profoundly honored. I saw a triple opportunity to introduce an eminent keynote speaker who has done a great deal to advance my chosen field, a forum where I could express my support for this exciting new initiative to secure Gratz's future, and an opportunity to express my deep personal gratitude to the college and the circle of donors who support this unique and wonderful institution of learning. When I first applied to Gratz, I had already been conducting research in the Slovak National Archive for a few years. I knew pretty much what I wanted to study and how it contributes new knowledge about the Holocaust. As we watch events unfold in the world today, the region where I do my work has taken on an even greater relevance and importance as we seek to unravel and contextualize the troubled history of the region. I sensed that a PhD from Graz would enhance my work, but at the time when I applied, I had not realized exactly how. I only knew that I needed to zoom out and study other aspects of Holocaust history and genocide outside the confines of my chosen area. Thanks to my coursework, I have become more skilled when it comes to mining the literature for valuable insights, in addition to progressively cultivating a greater ease with theoretical frameworks. Without realizing it, I had been doing some things right in the archives, but I see in retrospect that I needed to understand how theoretical considerations undergird the work of generating new knowledge. Gratz met me where I was, and helped me craft new ways of thinking about my topic in addition to exposing me to the larger picture. Dr. Cutler is no stranger to the larger picture. I am pleased to introduce him tonight. He is the Daniel and Clara Isaacman Distinguished Visiting Professor in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Gratz College. Dr. Cutler is founder and international chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and Canada's Special Envoy on Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism. He is a member of the High-Level Panel of Legal Experts on Media Freedom, Emeritus Professor of Law at McGill University, an international human rights lawyer, and counsel to prisoners of conscience. He is former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada and longtime Member of Parliament. He is the author of numerous, numerous publications and seminal legal articles, and has written upon and intervened in landmark Charter of Rights cases in the areas of free speech, freedom of religion, minority rights, peace law, and war crimes justice. Dr. Cutler is the recipient of 14 honorary doctorates, where he has been recognized as a scholar and advocate of international stature. He has been named an officer of the Order of Canada, an officer of the National Order of Quebec, and is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards. Today, as we remember Yom HaShoah and witness the terrible events and strife in Ukraine, Dr. Cutler's work should remind us all that the links between the past and the present and the present and the future are real so that we may all be inspired to come together to change the world for the better for future generations to come. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Madeline, for those really kind words of, of introduction. And may I commend you for your exemplary scholarship that is so reflective of the excellence of Grads College of the Center for Holocaust and uh, Genocide Studies uh, which I regard as amongst the best, if not the best in America. And so may I begin by saying how moved and humbled I am uh, to be addressing you as the first uh, Isaacman uh, Professor of Holocaust and uh, Genocide uh, Studies. And I have to say that I also feel a very close personal uh, connection to Gretz for two reasons. The first is my longtime friendship and respect for Dr. Lena Allen Shore, who taught at Gratz for over 30 years. 
who, whose scholarship and writings have been a source of inspiration for thousands of students at Graz College and who has inspired the foundational underpinnings of what has evolved also into the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and whom I might add uh, is the mother of two close friends of mine, <coughs> Michelle and Jacques Shore, and our families spent many Chagim together, Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot, and so Dr. Lena Allen Shore, Zichronali Bracha, a blessed memory, has been an inspiration not only for Graz College, but for myself and and my family and uh, being connected to her. And Graz is a very moving and as I say, humbling moment for me. And a second consideration and personal connection is here too my friendship and my respect for Paul uh, Finkelman with whom uh, I've been associated uh, from Ottawa to Saskatchewan in Canada and beyond, and who is now your distinguished chancellor. And so you can see how, for me, this evening uh, brings together so many uh, memories and friendships and uh, inspirational moments. So it is not just another address to another college. It is a very personal, uh, and as I said, moving connection uh, for me. As it happens, and as was mentioned earlier, I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem, where I've been participating these last few days in the first ever gathering of special envoys for the combating of anti-Semitism here in Jerusalem, and where we have been uh, spending much of our deliberations at Yad Vashem, and where we have been uh, listening and being moved uh, by testimonies and encounters uh, with Holocaust uh, survivors. And yesterday evening's torch lighting ceremony by survivors was a very compelling experience for all of us who were there, I would say an unforgettable uh, experience. And really being at Yad Vashem and being with the survivors, one is in effect bearing witness to horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened. And I'm speaking also in that sense, amidst an international drumbeat of evil and reference was made to that earlier, including the mass atrocities uh, targeting the Rohingya and the Uyghurs, uh, Afghans and Afghanistans, the assault on the rules-based order by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Commission of War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity, and where China is engaged in a frontal assault on the rules-based uh, order of which as we meet the frontal assault on not only the democracy movement, but on democracy itself in Hong Kong is yet another case study. And the increasing imprisonment of human rights defenders, of political prisoners, and the tragedy of the culture of impunity that underpins it. The whole amidst what I would call an, the silence of the international bystander community. And so at this point, we need to ask ourselves what it is that we have learned these past 80 years, and more importantly, what is it that we must do? I say this because I'm also speaking to you, as I said, from Jerusalem, where there have been in the last few days a series of reports with respect to an explosion in anti-Semitism. For example, the League for Human Rights in Canada with its annual 
audit of anti-Semitism uh, in Canada now has determined in its report that 2021 witnessed the highest escalation in anti-Semitic incidences in the last 40 years or since it first began reporting on, on these things. And more than that, that there a disturbing escalation in anti-Semitic violence, in incendiary incitement in the social media. And what was reported in Canada has also been reflected in similar studies in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in France, and I can go on. And so as it was referred to by my colleagues in the special envoy gathering, that we are witnessing an explosion as we meet in anti-Semitism of a global character. And so, as I said, the question, which is the theme of my remarks this evening, amidst the backdrop of uh, being in uh, Jerusalem and sharing the messages from here is, what is it that we have learned in these past 80 years? And more importantly, what is it that we must do? For we meet really at a painful and poignant moment of remembrance and reminder, of bearing witness, of not only learning, but acting upon the lessons of the Holocaust. And what I hope to do now is to summarize for you some 10 lessons, 10 compelling lessons that not only must be appreciated, but no less important, must be acted upon. For reasons of time, I hope you'll excuse the abbreviation of each of the lessons. I'm sure uh, that the Gretz Center of Holocaust and Genocide Studies uh, needs no elaboration. And in fact, I'm here this evening, uh, not so much as a teacher, but as your student. And I look forward to our continuing relationship and to being the beneficiary of your uh, scholarship and your expertise. And so here with the lessons. The first lesson is the danger of forgetting, of the imperative of remembrance. Whereas Holocaust survivor said just yesterday evening, repeating the words of Elie Wiesel, that forgetting is like killing the survivors a second time. Of the Holocaust, as Elie Wiesel put it, as a war against the Jews in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were targeted victims. And as Yehuda Bauer, Professor Yehuda Bauer said yesterday, and the others became victims because of the targeting of the Jews. Of the demonization of the Jew and the humanization of the Jew as prologue and justification for their mass murder. Of the mass murder of 6 million Jews, 1.5 million of whom were children, not as a matter of abstract statistics, but as we say at these moments of remembrance, unto each person there is a name. Each person is an identity. Each person is a universe, reminding us of the Talmudic teaching that if you save a single life, it is as if you have saved an entire universe. And so the overriding first lesson here, that we are each, wherever we are, the guarantors of each other's destiny. Otherwise said, and this too, a dominant theme in our gathering yesterday and in these past two days, with Holocaust survivors, which brings me to the second lesson. And that is the danger, indeed the existential threat of anti-Semitism. Of anti-Semitism as the oldest 
longest, most enduring, most virulent, and lethal of hatreds. One that mutates and metastasizes over time, but is always anchored in one historical, generic, conspiratorial trope. And that is the Jews and the Jewish people as the enemy of all that is good and the embodiment of all that is evil. Of the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century, as metaphor and message for this lesson. Let there be no mistake about it. 1.3 million people were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. 1.1 million of them were Jews. Jews, in a word, were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism itself did not die at Auschwitz. It remains the bloody canary in the mine shaft of global evil today, toxic to democracies, as Dr. Ahmed Shahid, the UN Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Religion and Belief, put it in his landmark report on anti-Semitism to the United Nations in October 2019. An assault on our common humanity and where we have a responsibility individually and collectively to combat this global anti-Semitism in protection of our democracy, dignity, and indeed in protection of our common humanity. Which brings me now to the third lesson, the danger of state sanction incitement to hate and genocide, our responsibility to prevent. For the Holocaust was made possible not only by the industrialization of mass murder and the machinery of death, but by incendiary incitement, by the personification of the Jew as the embodiment of evil, and where mankind could only be redeemed by the death of the Jew. It is this teaching of contempt, this demonizing of the other, this is where it all began as the Supreme Court of Canada put it in a set of landmark judgments, that the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chamber, said the court. It began with words. These, as the court put it, are the chilling facts of history. These, as the court put it, are the catastrophic effects of racism. And in yet another compelling principle and precedent, not as well known as it deserves to be, the court held that the very incitement to genocide is not only a warning about a preventable tragedy, but the very incitement to genocide constitutes a crime under the Genocide Convention, whether or not acts of genocide follow. And so we have a responsibility, a responsibility to recognize to address, to prevent this incitement to genocide, lest it take us down the road to this preventable uh, tragedy. And I remind you also, as we commemorate, as we meet the 28th anniversary of the genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda, where some 10,000 Rwandans were murdered every day for three months, that this too began with state-sanctioned incitement to genocide. And in fact, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda affirmed in its judgment the principles and precedents of the Supreme Court judgment of Canada that I have cited. Bringing me now to the fourth lesson, the dangers of Holocaust denial and distortion, inversion and minimization. Holocaust denial and distortion in the word are not only, as they are, an assault on memory and truth, but they are a conspiracy to whitewash and cover up the worst crimes in history. 
an assault on the very constituents of our democracy, human dignity, and truth. And so as we meet, we must also appreciate, and this too was reported upon in our meeting of special envoys, that we are witnessing an explosion of such Holocaust denial and distortion, minimization and inversion, which is finding particular expression also in the social media. Where, for example, and I can go on at length here, but just some quick examples. Where, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic has been weaponized to blame the Jews, the Jewish people in Israel for manufacturing the COVID virus, for causing its spread, for profiting from it. Classic tropes engaged now in Holocaust denial, distortion, minimization, and the like. Where the anti-vaxxers, as you know, have not only been donning the yellow star from Montreal uh, to Miami and in Europe and belong, but compare themselves to the inmates of the concentration camps and even to the death camp Auschwitz. Where Vladimir Putin seeks to justify his criminal invasion and aggression, his horrific war crimes and crimes against humanity in the Ukraine by beginning the invasion on February 24th and justifying it through what he called the denazification of Ukraine. A false and criminalizing distortion that has been repeated from the onset of the invasion itself. And we're yet in another cruel inversion and mocking of history and memory. Israel and Israelis are compared to Nazis and to the Nazi genocide. Yet another manifestation of the demonological anti-Semitism, uh, which our special envoys were conversing about. Leading me to lesson five, the danger of silence in the face of evil. As my mentor and Nobel Peace Laureate Holocaust survivor, Eloise L. wrote in his path-breaking 1986 Nobel Peace Lecture, and I quote, we must always take sides. Neutrality always means coming down on the side of the oppressor, never on the side of the victim. Always coming down on the side of the tormentor, not on the side of the tormented. And he added that wherever men and women are persecuted because of their relates, race or religion or political opinion, that place at that time must be our place. As he put it, there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest against injustice. And so here too, the lesson of learning and action that we must speak up, stand up and be counted against injustice and not look around to see whoever else is standing before we make a judgment to do so. Because in the world in which we live, there are few people prepared to stand, let alone be counted. And so it's our responsibility here to shatter the silence, a silence which ends up being complicity with evil itself. Leading me now to lesson six, which follows inexorably from it. And that is the dangers of indifference and inaction in the face of mass atrocity and genocide. The responsibility here to prevent and protect. For Holocaust crimes resulted not only from the state sanction and incitement to hate and genocide, as I mentioned, not only from the industrialized machinery of mass murder, but from crimes of indifference, from conspiracies of silence. What makes the Holocaust and the genocides that followed in the with the Tutsis in Rwanda or in Darfur, or more recently with regard to the Rohingya and with regard 
to the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region of China. What makes these mass atrocities so horrific are not only the horrors of these genocides themselves, let alone uh, the horrors of the Holocaust of which I've been speaking. And I make no comparison between the two. I'm just speaking here about the crimes of indifference and the conspiracies of science. What makes them so horrific are not only the horrors of the Holocaust and the genocides themselves. What makes them so horrific is that these crimes were preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as today, we know and we are yet to act with respect, as I said, whether it be the Rohingyas, the Uyghurs, and the like. Lesson seven, and that is the mass atrocities being committed amidst a culture of impunity, reminding us of our responsibility to bring war criminals to justice. If the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st century have been the ages of atrocity, they have also been the ages of impunity. Few of the perpetrators have been brought to justice. And so it is our responsibility to ensure that there's justice for the victims and accountability for the human rights violators, that these hostis, humanists, generous, that these human rights violators, these genocides are brought to justice and that their criminality is not further incentivized by cultures of impunity. Indeed, if we look at the question now of the Russian criminal aggression in Ukraine, it too, was incentivized by a culture of impunity. For the international community was a bystander community. When Russia was bombing Chechnya and Grozny at the beginning of the 21st century, when they invaded Georgia in 2008, when Russia seized Crimea in 2014, when it indiscriminately was bombing in Syria and Aleppo and the like and produced the largest humanitarian catastrophe with respect to, in Syria, more than 5 million refugees, more than 12 million uh, displaced, and the international community acted in its inactive bystander capacity. And so when we do not bring war criminals to justice, when we do not hold them accountable, we incentivize more crimes and the Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a case study. Bringing me to lesson eight and moving to a close, the danger of la trahison des clercs, the betrayal of the elites. What made the Holocaust possible was not only the bureaucratization of genocide as Professor Robert Lifton characterized it, personified by the Wannsee conference by Adolf Eichmann's bureaucratic murder. What made the dangers so possible and implementable were the trahison declare, the betrayal of the elites, doctors and scientists, judges and lawyers, church leaders and educators, engineers and architects. In a word, Nuremberg crimes were the crimes of the Nuremberg elites. The double entendre of Nuremberg, of Nuremberg racism, but also of Nuremberg principles and the Nuremberg justice principles must inform our learning as it becomes our legacy. Lesson nine, the dangers of assaults on the vulnerable and the powerless and the responsibility that we have to give voice to the voiceless and to empower the <clears throat> powerless. The whole dramatized by those of us who visited the death camp Auschwitz, dramatized there by the remnants of shoes 
and crutches and hair and suitcases, as Professor Henry Friedlander put it in his book on the origins of genocide. One of the first groups singled out for mass murder were the Jewish disabled. And so, as I said, our responsibility always to be a voice for the voiceless, to empower the powerless, be they the disabled, the poor, the refugee, the elderly, the women victimized by violence, or the vulnerable child. As my daughter Gila told me when she was 15 years of age, a lesson that I never forgot when she said to me, she's now a, a lawyer herself in her early 40s, who said to me at the time, Daddy, if you want to know what the real test of human rights is, then always ask yourself at any time, in any situation, in any part of the world, is it good for children? Is what is happening good for children? I'm sad to say that what is happening amidst the drumbeat of evil is not good for children. The test of a just society is how we treat the most vulnerable amongst us. And this brings me to the last uh, example here. And that is the lesson, that, <clears throat> the last lesson and a dramatic example here of what we need to do is that we always have to be approaching this sense of mass atrocity that I've been speaking with a sense of urgency, with a sense of accountability and appreciate that our own indifference and our own inaction will itself be complicity with evil. And may I close because of this special evening of remembrance of Yom HaShoah Gura, because in Israel, one emphasizes uh, not only the National Holocaust Remembrance, but also uh, the bravery, the bravery that underpins this moment of remembrance and reminder. And that is to close with a word to Holocaust survivors. For you have endured the worst of inhumanity, but somehow you found in the resources of your own humanity, the capacity, the resources, the resilience, the will to go on, to build a family, to build a community. And we, in whatever community that you reside, we have all been your beneficiaries. And so, Mikhail Lechayel, may you continue to inspire us to go from strength to strength. And may we be worthy of these moments of remembrance and reminder. And may these moments of remembrance and reminder result in our action and our sense of urgency in having to act. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erwin. Uh, my name is Paul Finkelman. I am the Chancellor of Gratz College, a distinguished professor of history. And most importantly, especially tonight, I have been a colleague and a friend of Erwin for many years. Uh, thank you. I will be monitoring the question and answers. Uh, if anybody wants to put in a question, please go to the Q&A on your Zoom and put in a question. But I want to start with one, which is, as we have been watching the horrendous, murderous invasion of Ukraine by a, by a country that can only be described as the modern version of barbarians. Um, a number of people have accused Putin and his minions of trying to commit genocide. Others have said, no, it is not genocide, it is something else. And so what I'm wondering is, 
if it is not genocide, do we in the human rights community and on Yom HaShoah need to come up with new language to describe something as unbelievably evil as what is going on if it is not yet genocide? Or do we say that genocide takes many forms and this is a new form of genocide? No, I don't think we need a uh, new language. I think we need uh, to hold Putin and those associated with him accountable for the crimes for which the evidence exists that he has already committed and is committing. I'm referring to uh, the crime of aggression personified by the very invasion of Ukraine and uh, that ongoing invasion, by the horrific war crimes and crimes against uh, humanity. And there are legal initiatives that can be taken and some that have been taken. For example, when Putin uh, initially on February 24th began his uh, invasion of Ukraine, he sought to justify it by using the distorted notion of denazification of, the, of Ukraine. That's why he was doing it. Ukraine, four days later, initiated a complaint against him in the International Court of Justice for falsifying and thereby breaching the Genocide Convention. And the International Court of Justice already took provisional measures to determine that Putin falsified the Genocide uh, Convention and that he has to cease and desist from that uh, criminal aggression. We've also seen the first ever collective referral by 39 states of Putin's war crimes and crimes against humanity to the International uh, Criminal Court. And there are recommendations now to establish a hybrid tribunal, as have been set up elsewhere, for the consideration of the crimes of aggression, because uh, those crimes are not prosecutable in the other uh, frameworks that I mentioned, that, which brings me to the case of genocide. I am somewhat concerned that if we get into a debate on whether, whether this is genocide or not, this may deflect away from the horrific crimes that are already being uh, committed. And the notion of crimes against humanity is itself inclusive of the worst of those crimes. Indeed, genocide is considered to be the ultimate crime against humanity. It's a crime against uh, uh, humanity. And so I have recommended to uh, the Canadian Parliament to do what they did with regard to the Uyghurs, to hold hearings and make a determination as to whether or not the mass atrocities being committed by Putin's Russia do or do not co constitute uh, acts of genocide. And I have to say that just yesterday, I was somewhat surprised that the Canadian parliament made a determination that Putin, in fact, is engaged in acts of genocide targeting the Ukraine. I have felt, and I mentioned with this, I'll close, that I thought they should have conducted hearings in consequence of which they should have made that and could have made that determination. But they have made that and become the first country and parliament in the world to make that determination uh, with regard to uh, what uh, Putin and those associated with him have been doing in their mass atrocities. My, my compliments to our neighbors to the north. Thank you. Uh, one of the people who's on who is listening has asked, what can we do as individuals? What should we be doing as individuals to push the justice and the prescriptions for justice that you have set out for us? Number one, I think we should support the ongoing uh, case uh, initiated against Russia by Ukraine in the International Court of Justice, as I said, provisional measures have already been taken uh, by, by the court. We need to ensure that that initiative is sustained and enhanced. Number two, we need to support the reference to the International Criminal Court. The special prosecutor has opened an investigation of Putin and those associated with him for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Wherever we can help uh, support the investigative process, the evidentiary process, uh, the legal uh, process, we should do so. Number three, because uh, the crime of aggression uh, is not one uh, for which 
the either the International uh, Criminal Court that I mentioned or the International Court of Justice has jurisdiction, we should establish a hybrid a tribunal for which there is precedent to deal expressly and specifically with the crime of aggression. So that that is which Nuremberg uh, in the Nuremberg principles was defined as the supreme evil. So that crime of aggression, you know, should not be ignored. And we should set up a tribunal for that purpose. Number four, a number of countries like Canada have uh, universal jurisdiction laws, which means that if any Russian who has committed any of the crimes that I mentioned is found in our jurisdiction, we can prosecute that person for crimes within our jurisdiction. So I believe that is yet another. Um, number five, I would say we should encourage our respective parliaments to do what the Canadian parliament uh, has done with respect to holding hearings and making a uh, determination and whether these mass atrocities indeed uh, do uh, constitute genocide. And we should put Putin and those uh, uh, associated with him, put him on notice that they will be held accountable for their crimes. So can we, we have two emails, questions from somebody who is in Canada. You brought your own cheering section along across the border today. Uh, and uh, this is someone who is writing to us from Ottawa and says that uh, Canada has announced that it will make it illegal to deny the Holocaust. That is, it will make it a Holocaust denial a crime. Um, as someone who's written about free speech and who's someone who cares about freedom of expression, and of course, the Canadian Constitution is different than the American Constitution in this area. What are your thoughts on criminalizing um, this sort of evil speech? And is there a danger in criminalizing it? Uh, we, we always think of the great uh, American Supreme Court Justice, the first Jew on the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, who always said that the answer to bad speech is good speech it's more speech. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are. We yeah. can learn from Canada, perhaps. Uh, well, let, first, let me begin by saying that uh, Brandeis was one of my uh, heroes and, and role models. When I was a youngster, my father read to me from uh, Justice Brandeis's work. And I always remember uh, his own uh, landmark a Law Review article back in 1890 on uh, the right to privacy is the most mm -hmm. comprehensive of all freedoms and the right most valued by civilized people. So Brandeis for me has always been a, a teacher. Now, when we come to the, uh, the speech, I agree with him that the answer is a more speech, but that doesn't mean that all speech is protected speech, even under the American First Amendment. Even under the American First Amendment, perjury is not protected speech because of the right to a fair trial. Pornography is not a uh, protected uh, speech because the right to human dignity. Consumer, misleading consumer advertising is not protected speech. Fighting words is not protected speech. Treason is not protected speech because I can go on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in Canada, we have said, you know, hate speech is not protected speech. And within that framework of hate speech, and uh, hate, some hate speech is and a good deal, but there are certain times when that hate speech crosses the line. And what uh, the Canadian jurisprudence has said that apart from the fact that not all speech is protected speech, as some mistakenly say that about the First Amendment, and as somebody who has been a beneficiary of an American uh, education at Yale Law School and was taught by some of the great free speech theorists, I remember Dean Abraham Goldstein at Yale Law School teaching us and saying, not all speech is protected speech, despite what the First Amendment says. And when you get onto this question of hate speech, as the Canadian Supreme Court has said, there is also the right of minorities to protection against group vilifying speech. That this is not just a speech issue, it's an equality issue. When of the singling out of a targeted minority for selective opprobrium and indictment through that hate may itself not be protected speech and may also constitute uh, uh, and equality. I, I can go on, but on the particular issue of the uh, proposed legislation now with regard to Holocaust denial, it also follows the recent uh, landmark 
UN General Assembly Resolution, the United Nations, on the 80th anniversary of the Wansi Conference, calling on all state parties. And it was adopted by all countries, save for Iran, uh, at the UN on January 20th, 2022, identifying five initiatives that state parties should undertake with regard to combating you know, Holocaust denial and uh, distortion. This uh, approach is uh, a legislative one, is a one option. Now the matter is going before the Canadian Parliament. It will be considered, it will be debated uh, in the House. And if in fact a determination is made that Holocaust denial because of its assault on memory and truth, on uh, dignity and, and right, uh, deserves to be criminalized, I'm sure it will be couched in a way that both protects free speech, protects equality, protects uh, minorities to group vilifying speech, and protects against a cruel rebuke uh, to Holocaust survivors and their memory uh, through this Holocaust denial. So we have time for one short question and one short answer, and then we will move on to the rest of the program. And my short question is, I think almost Everyone on this call and this Zoom and probably many, many people in the world believe that the Russian government, starting with Putin, have now passed into the area of war crimes. They are war criminals. What do you expect to happen to them? Will they become unable to leave Russia and visit anywhere? Will, will, do you think that the world will essentially tell Putin you need to stay in Moscow for the rest of your life or go well, to uh, Belarus. Yeah, uh, the quick thing, as I said, it was the culture of impunity uh, with regard to Putin over the last 20 years, as I said, since the 21st century began that incentivized uh, his criminality. And there's been dual criminality. There's not only been the externalized aggression that I described from uh, Grozny uh, to, to the Crimea and now with regard to Ukraine, there's also been massive domestic aggression. Uh, we don't appreciate that even before he went into the Ukraine, the number of political prisoners in uh, Russia increased tenfold over the last five years. And as I'm speaking with you, a heroic uh, leader of um, the Russian democratic movement, Vladimir Kara Mirza, who uh, is not only a leading Russian author, uh, public intellectual uh, human rights advocate, uh, somebody who's been responsible for bringing about Magnitsky legislation in your country, in the United States, in Canada, in the European uh, community and elsewhere, who testified before the, and I'm very quickly this, testified before the Canadian Parliament in 2015, calling for Magnitsky legislation, went back to Russia, was poisoned and almost died, came back again in 2017, testified principally responsible for Canada adopting unanimously Magnitsky legislation in 2010, went back to Russia, was again poisoned, almost died. I say all this because uh, three weeks ago, uh, he was uh, arrested on a visit to Russia where he felt he had to be with his people because of the invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, he's now being subjected to charges of being a foreign agent, spreading malicious propaganda about Russia. He could, like Navalny, uh, be sentenced to long-term imprisonment and I'm mentioning this because that also incentivizes Putin's impunity. We have to hold him accountable uh, here too through Magnitsky sanctions so that no Russians can benefit uh, through travel, uh, through, uh, uh, and therefore we have to impose travel bans, asset seizure, and all those involved also on his domestic aggression, as well as all the legal initiatives we have to take with regard to his external aggression in the Ukraine. They're both part of the culture of impunity that has incentivized his domestic and international aggression over the last 20 years. Thank you, Erwin. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying up so late in Israel to uh, be on this program. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Rana Z. Honigman. Uh, Rana is a composer, a piano teacher, a proud Graz alumna. She 
received a master's in Jewish music from Gratz College. And in part, she was connected in doing her uh, master's thesis to the great creator of the Gratz Music Library, um, Erich Mandel, who uh, escaped from Germany and came to the United States and ended up being uh, the professor of cantorial music at Gratz College. Uh, she wrote about uh, him in her dissertation and she chronicles his life and his com compositions. And in honor of the occasion, Rana wrote the Mandel fantasy using Mandel's original liturgical music as thematic material for the piano piece. We are privileged tonight to have Rana with us to share her story and perform the Mandel fantasy. Please join me in welcoming Rana. Thank you for inviting me tonight to share with you about a very special person and his connection to Graz College, Eric Mandel. Eric Mandel lived with his wife, Martha, in an apartment building near the Philadelphia Art Museum. It just so happened they lived across the hall from my beloved piano teacher, Jean Behrend. When Jean realized I was taking Jewish music classes at Graz, she insisted on introducing me to her neighbor. At that first meeting, Eric was already in his 70s and suffering from Parkinson's. I remember vividly how Martha put on a metronome, which enabled Eric to use his walker to move in rhythmic steps around his apartment. By the time I started to interview Eric in 1980 and 81, he was living in the Philadelphia Geriatric Center. I took a cassette player and notebook with me to each interview. The cassette tapes were given to Sholem Altman in addition to the completed thesis and are probably somewhere still in the library. It was Dr. Irving Cohen who recommended doing an oral biography of Eric for my thesis, required to attain my master's in Jewish music from Graz. He realized the importance of Eric's unique collection and his interesting life story. Oral biographies were a pretty new concept back then, and I was grateful for his guidance on how to go about it. Each interview attempted to hone in on a particular aspect of his life and his passion for collecting. My thesis covers much more in detail Eric's life after coming to the States because he did not want to dwell on his time in Germany during the war. He managed to transfer the entirety of his first collection of Jewish music to cousins in Holland in 1939 before he fled Germany. Unfortunately, when his cousins returned from living in hiding, the collection was gone, a huge loss. Undeterred, Eric started collecting again when he made it to Philadelphia in 1941. Eric was meticulous about the care and organization of his collection. Some of his topics include Tin Pan Alley songs, synagogue music, Jewish workers songs, the idea of Zion and Kol Nidre. Martha Mandel was instrumental in helping to catalog all the details about each entry in the collection, composer, arranger, vocal or instrumental description, language, etc. The collection also includes about 400 books, which at the time of the writing of my thesis were being cataloged by Werner Victor. The goal was to integrate these books into the resources of the main Gratz library, so they would be more accessible to the public. This part of the collection includes 65 rare volumes of biographies, autobiographies, and books on the history of liturgical and biblical music. Sometime in the early 2000s, I was contacted by Dr. Manfred Keller, a Protestant minister from Bochum, Germany. The German government was planning on rebuilding the synagogue where Eric was a cantor during the war. And Dr. Keller was interested in publishing a book on Eric in conjunction with the official festivities of the dedication of the new synagogue. Evidently, I was the only person who had ever written anything about Eric. He asked me for permission to publish my thesis in German with access to government records and a cache of pictures and documented documents provided by a surviving nephew of Eric's. Dr. Keller was able to fill in many details about Eric's early life. The resulting book is a collaboration with Dr. Keller writing on Eric's early years and my thesis providing the information about Eric's life in the US. 
Both the German version and the original thesis include original compositions by Eric. Some had been published by the Cantor's Assembly and some others had remained unpublished. In 2005, I made my first of two trips to Bochum, Germany, where I was hosted by Dr. Keller. The synagogue was under construction, but we were able to take a tour. I was taken by surprise when the press showed up to interview me and take pictures. They treated me like a celebrity because of my relationship to Eric. It was all a little unreal. During this trip, I met people involved in the translation and publication of the finished book. In addition, I met Eric's nephew who survived the war being raised in a convent. When I returned in 2007, it was for the dedication of the synagogue which had been completed. My husband and I joined in the procession with the Torahs starting at the location of the original synagogue and walking about a half a mile to the new synagogue located on the newly named Eric Mendelplatz. There were many dignitaries in attendance along with the press. Once again, I was interviewed with my comments appearing in the newspapers the next day. My grad's degree has enabled me to use my knowledge of Jewish music to teach in Jewish day schools and Hebrew schools, teach and chant Torah and Migilat Esther, lead Jewish children choirs, and compose, publish, and perform Jewish music. In honor of the dedication of the synagogue in Bochum, I composed the Mandel fantasy using the themes of Eric's liturgical music in a fantasy form with improvisational material set to my own harmonies. Eric's lovely Havat Olam, well known in Philadelphia and heard accompanying the slideshow before the start of the program tonight, was actually the preferred melody of the synagogue we joined upon moving to the Bay Area in California. In addition to the Ahavat Olam, other motifs were taken from Eric's Ein Kelohenu, Vishamru, Matovu, and Shalom Alechem. The ending motif is taken from the pitches for the Torah trope for Sof Pasuk. First performed by me in Germany at a reception given by Dr. Keller as part of the dedication festivities, the fantasy was recently performed again in Munster, Germany in a program hosted by Dr. Keller. In 2021, Dr. Keller contacted me expressing his interest in purchasing the Mandel Library as he realized the uniqueness of the collection. At the same time as his inquiries to Graz, Dr. Edwin Sarusi, a music professor from Hebrew University on sabbatical in the States was researching the collection. Fortunately for Graz, Dr. Sarusi was able to enlighten Dr. Elif on the importance of this amazing collection which includes some books not found anywhere else. The goal now under Dr. Ellis' leadership is to have this wonderful library digitized and remain at Graz. Although disappointed that his offer was turned down, Dr. Keller is grateful that this precious library will soon be digitized and available for generations to come. It truly is the jewel in the crown. I am thankful to have been part of keeping Eric's memory alive and through my thesis, helping in a small way to maintain his library for Graz. Zichrono Livercha, may his memory be for a blessing. It is a great honor now to be able to perform the Mandel Fantasy for you tonight. I hope you enjoy it.
it's really moving. <laughs> Gratitude to Professor Codler for giving agency to the past and Verona for giving sound another chance. Um, I'm, I'm really blown away. I'm Zab Elif, I'm president, it happens in September, of Gratz College. Uh, what a moving experience. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you uh, who are joining by Zoom, uh, you've seen just how powerful our programming has been. It's Yom HaShoah, Rura, it's no exception. For all of you here, this is actually the first time that we've been able to do this with safety precautions. Um, and it, it's, it's incredibly powerful for me uh, here at Grass. In 1979, Dr. Dory Lau of Yale University traveled to Philadelphia to deliver a lecture. A Holocaust survivor, Lau was a clinical psychiatrist and trauma researcher. His topic focused on Holocaust testimonies and psychological distress. Months earlier, Lau's research had generated a curious collaboration with the television director, Laurel Block, resulting in the Holocaust Survivors Film Project now at Yale University. This was something brand new, a testimonial archive. Early in their decade, Dr. Yafa Eliyah had commenced her important collection project, Brooklyn College, but that didn't focus squarely on testimonies. Laub's Philadelphia presentation, on the other hand, attended by a grass professor of modern Jewish history and a clinical social worker, inspired the establishment of America's second Holocaust testimonial project. Nora Levin, that historian, and Joseph Fisher, that social worker, founded the Holocaust Oral History Archive of Grass College. By 1982, the archive had taped 90 survivors with a laser-thin budget, produced transcripts of their testimonies. By 1985, that number swelled to 600, now numbers nearly 1,000. The Jewish exponent wrote around that time that their idea is spreading. The newspaper had in mind Dr. Levin's three-hour workshop in Trenton, New Jersey. I have in mind the quick-spreading idea within the halls of Gratz College. One can draw a straight line from the Holocaust Oral History Archive to the formation of Gratz's Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights. Today, the center boasts the world's largest graduate program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. It hosts a biennial Arnold and Esther Tuzman Memorial Teach-In, the Information Barbara and Fred Court Holocaust Geniza Project, part of the LB Van Mandel Collection. We get along quite well with Dr. Keller at this point, and myriad endowed lectures. Very soon, thanks to a matching grant from the Claims Conference, the Holocaust Oral History Archive will go fully digital. Part of a brand new website meant to enrich the studies of Gratz students in the wider community. The center then is one of Gratz's most profound commitments to apply Jewish wisdom in education. Our enrolled students and public audiences access distressing lessons of the Holocaust and genocides to perform educational alchemy to make positive meaning on behalf of human rights out of the despair and sorrow. Elie Wiesel once told an interviewer, once you bring life into the world, you must protect it. You must protect it by changing the world. The professors, public school educators, museum directors and docents and adult learners who attach themselves to Gratz's Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights do their very, very best to follow Wiesel's wisdom. I'm eager to announce that Gratz College is launching its founding stakeholder campaign to sustain and to augment the center so that many people can share in this holy humanitarian vision. I'm even more eager to honor violence. Gratz alumna and longtime volunteer and leader of the Holocaust Oral History Archive. I first met Violet just before last Rosh Hashanah, remember that? And we spoke about the importance of testimonial archives. I listened to her story, some of which I'm sure she will share this evening. I responded that it sounded to me like you make much meaning out of your work. Violet seemed to agree. She invited me to meet with Josie and her other devoted volunteer archivists 
and she promised me cookies. <laughs> Along with Violet, we honor, we honor the archive. Professor Nora Levin passed away in 1989, I've never met her. Many of the volunteers she and Josie Fisher have trained have blessed us as well. Their efforts are consecrated on frame memorial plaques upstairs in the archives offices, part of a unique space, almost like a synagogue we've talked about, that Violet and Josie have operated within for almost 20 years every Tuesday afternoon. Since 1989, Josie Fisher has served as the director of the Holocaust Oral History Archive. She is a Holocaust scholar, renowned public educator, and past valedictorian of Gratz College. Much more than anyone else alive today, perhaps, most definitely, actually, Josie is responsible for Gratz's extraordinary impact in the fields of Holocaust and genocide studies. She is also a dear friend to Violet Zeitlin. It is therefore altogether fitting that I call on Josie to present Violet with the Gratz Medal. This is only the sixth occasion in which the Gratz Medal has been awarded. Mentor recipient who embodies the college's commitment to community leadership and learning. The medal bears the seal designed for Gratz College in 1900. It carries with it a wonderful legacy and a tribute to a most deserving and special person. Josie, I am truly delighted for you to honor tonight's most deserving and special person. On this very date, in 1999, April 28, 23 years ago, I presented the Holocaust Oral History Archive as one of the <coughs> treasures of the Tubman Library. I always look when I'm presenting for a friendly face, somebody who might be listening to me. <laughs> and that night, there was a woman in the back row with curly hair who was leaning forward and listening. Right after the presentation, she came up and asked me if she could volunteer. How could I say no? She had been already showing me how eager she was to be a part of this very important project. So tonight is Violet's 23rd anniversary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the archive started in 1979. It was a volunteer project under the leadership of Professor Nora Levin, one of the first to teach a full year course in colleges on the history of the Holocaust. Some of us have been her students. Some were survivors that Nora knew. But that night in 1999, several of our staff, including Nora, had already died. And when Violet came up to me that night, how little I knew that her joining our staff would reinforce our vision of how we would preserve our years of work, our precious testimonies, and how we would make them accessible. As one of the earliest collections in the United States, we had been able to interview survivors who could give vibrant accounts of pre-war life in Europe. Survivors on our staff had access to colleagues of Raul Wallenberg and to other rescuers, German Social Democrats, a rare interview with the Roma, to fellow kind children rescued through the Kinder Transport. We interviewed people who had fled to Shanghai during 
the rickshaw reunions here in Philadelphia, where we went to the hotel and set up a table for them to register in the lobby and then interviewed them in their rooms. We interviewed at the 1995 American gathering of Holocaust survivors here in Philadelphia. We had interviews in Polish and Russian and German and Yiddish. And most of our interviews have that sound, that sound of the original language in the words that the survivors share with us. It's clear from the beginning that researchers and students would need transcriptions of our interviews and we depended on professional transcribers for that first draft. But it's our volunteer staff who meticulously pour over each interview, checking for verbatim accuracy, researching correct spellings of foreign words and of place names. This requires tremendous focus, discipline, and curiosity. And those qualities are paramount in Violet's personality. In 1999, Vi was completing her undergraduate work at Graz. And when she discovered this treasure of the historical record, she simultaneously became a key staff member while also using the archive's primary sources to complete her academic degree. We had another unique collection interviews with soldiers who had witnessed the liberation of the camps and prisoners of war. It was this material that intrigued Violet and her independent research became her final thesis. Violet understood another basic tenet of our work, not only to preserve the original words but to bring them into public awareness. She initiated a commemorative booklet, Memories of the Liberation, to honor the 60th anniversary of the end of the war and the liberation of the camps. Later, she chose excerpts from interviews describing Jewish life in Germany for another booklet on the 70th anniversary of Kristallnacht created for both public programming and the classroom. These booklets provided a model for the use of primary source testimony, the original words which make history come alive. Our biggest undertaking entitled War Revealed, Memories of Prisoners of War and Witnesses to the Concentration Camps, which includes over 30 testimonies, featured Violet's academic research as the introduction. Our work and our dreams are coming to fruition. The sound of those voices on our audio tapes has been preserved through our strategic partnerships with Yad Vashem and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And now even more is possible with the infusion of support from the Barbara and Fred Port Foundation, the Claims Conference, Miriam Grossman, and other generous donors. The vision of President Ellick and the support of the Gratz administration will ensure access to researchers and students for years to come. We honor Violet tonight for her gift of self, <clears throat> together with all our volunteer staff, present and past, whose devotion will ensure the preservation of these original words. Therefore, it is my great honor to present the Gratz Medal to my friend, my right hand, 
the assistant director of the Holocaust Oral History Archive. I would say. Like Thank you, everybody, so much. I want to thank my family and friends who are here with me physically, spiritually, and on Zoom, and those who have contributed to this most important project. When I was approached about receiving this honor quite a few months ago, I was very hesitant. I didn't feel like I deserved an award for doing what makes me happy. But my family, my children, friends, or Andrea, who's with us, and especially my husband, Richard Zechron Lebracha, who passed away in December, encouraged me and were so proud of my work here. Over 35 years ago, when we moved to Elkins Park, we were thrilled to find wonderful Gratz College just a few blocks away. I was able to study for and finally receive my bachelor's degree in 2001 with the help and guidance of an incredible staff of teachers, the best anyone can find anywhere. And then for years, both Richard and I took advantage of the great continuing ed courses offered by Gratz. In 1999, as Josie stated, I was introduced to the gem of the Tuttleman Library, the Holocaust Oral History Archive. That luncheon featured Josie, our brilliant and fearless director. Josie was there at the start of the archive with Professor Nora Levin in 1979 and has dedicated her life to Holocaust education and presenting and preserving the testimonies of the survivors and witnesses of the Shoah. I was very moved and after the program, I asked Josie if they needed any volunteers. And thus, my Tuesdays became Kodesh. At the archive, I was introduced to the most amazing and dedicated group of people, most of them survivors themselves, who are no longer with us. And with such a very set of experiences that this was an education in itself. Our collection of over 900 testimonies include almost every Shoah experience one can imagine or has heard of, including the GI prisoners of war and those liberated who liberated the camps and witnessed the horrific aftermath. I am so proud to represent all these wonderful people, including our fabulous current staff who come religiously each Tuesday, Josie Fisher, Jerry Schneeberg, Natalie Packer-Markowitz, who have been here from, with us from the beginning, Nora Bolden, Nancy Messenger, Ann Krupnik, Barry Zimmerman, Evelyn Fair, and remotely Dory Schwartz Herman, whose mother Gloria Schwartz was one of our wonderful workers who left us much too early. Through the years, many of our volunteers, and especially our survivors, had doubts about whether the effort they so loving, lovingly made was worth it. Would anyone ever care or want to hear about what they and others had experienced? Would anyone actually learn from it? So I particularly want to thank Dr. Ellis and the Grant Administration for giving the Holocaust Oral History Archive the honor and spotlight it so dearly deserves. Thank you so much, everybody. Did you get your medal? <laughs> <laughs> wow, congratulations, Violet. Um, there really are not enough words um, 
to express how deeply you are appreciated and loved here at Grass. You and Josie and all of the archive members are a treasured part of this Grass community, not just because of who you are, but also the incredible work you do. It's so meaningful to us, um, the work you do to preserve memory so that we all may never forget. As President Ellis announced, Grass has launched a new campaign, the Founding Stakeholders Campaign. It is a campaign to endow the center, the new Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights here at Grass College. So on behalf of the college, I would like to thank all of the donors who have already made generous contributions. You can find their names on, listed on our website, where you can also learn more about the campaign and how you can also become a founding stakeholder. So I wanted to uh, close tonight uh, with a reminder that public events like these are a core part of what we do. Um, and they're also a key, a key component of the Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights. So mark your calendars for May 9th when we host U.S. Representative Madeline Dean for our annual Feinstone Lecture on the Meaning of Freedom. And also, a little bit down the road, November 6th, we are very excited um, to be hosting the biennial Tuzman, Arnold, and Esther Tuzman Memorial Holocaust Teach-In. Uh, and it, this year will feature uh, Alicia Wiesel in conversation with our Isaacman Distinguished Professor, Professor Erwin Cutler. So thank you all again. Thank you all of our, thanks to all of our evening's presenters, to my wonderful grads colleagues for their hard work in making this evening possible, and to all of you. Uh, again, Violet Mazel Tov, and uh, good night to all. See you again soon.